Jennifer, you've taken good care of that mother of yours. I'm trying. She's one of my favorite people. <laughs> Thank you, Holly. Beloved sisters, brothers, members, guests, and friends, both those assembled, socially distanced here in the sanctuary, and those of you who are joining us online, welcome once more to Richville United Church of Christ and this weekly space, this sacred time carved out to be about the things of God as we share our life and our faith together. Today we do so in a special way on World Communion Sunday, which we will be celebrating in a variety of ways throughout the liturgy, but most certainly when we approach the Lord's table. Uh, being mindful of World Communion Sunday, we do once again thank Holly for sharing her gifts with us today. Uh, Holly coming and serving as Mike is taking one of his weeks off, his vacation weeks, but even as he's taking vacation, he is sharing his musical gifts with another organization. Uh, so we're united across the miles, even just within this congregation and our staff. We are one people, one body, with one faith, one Lord, one baptism, <coughs> one table that we share on this World Community Sunday. And we also shared the table in a different way last night. So we want to give God thanks for everyone who participated in organizing uh, and pulling off an altered 49th Annual Fall Festival of Richville United Church of Christ. Uh, most notably, we want to thank the Spiritual Life Committee and the Finance and Stewardship Committee, as well as the Outreach Committee for being the, the bones uh, for the whole event. Um, Karen Gerber and Debbie Sezelchek, uh, notably leading up the team. We thank everyone who participated. We'll talk more about that during Joys and Concerns, all the specific contributions. But for the sake of announcements, which also is a joint concern, 
even though we only did carry out, even though we couldn't do some of the more uh, intimately hands-on activities that we've done in years past, check this out. Sold out of 225 meals. The meals themselves, uh, or excuse me, the, the total for the night was $4,252.51. On a year where we could only do carry out, uh, we didn't have some of the other activities. That's remarkable. So there was uh, $80 from 50-50. Bake sale brought in uh, uh, $385. The raffle baskets brought in $921. Uh, and the dinners themselves brought in $2,866. So uh, I think it's, it's only appropriate that we would give God thanks for one another and our friends who supported our ministry yesterday. <laughs> Before I go on any further, in, in light of World Communion Sunday, um, as Gary Dressler and I were directing traffic, I can't tell you how many people from other churches, uh, when we were showing them how to get their, their dinners, stopped and supported our ministry uh, from other denominations, from other congregations. So World Communion Sunday started last night, apparently. Karen, you wanted and to add. Dinner expenses were all covered, so that is with donations from that, for that which helped really helped too. Amen. So the, if you did not hear that additional note, um, this is all profit insofar as all of the expenses for the fall festival were covered by previous donors. So we rejoice uh, for the generosity of those who made that happen. Um, and as we serve a God of abundance, there are some leftovers. Uh, there's trail bologna and cheese for sale uh, following service, but I believe everything out else we pretty much uh, cleared out. There's some coleslaw left. Oh, there's some coleslaw as well. Okay, trail bologna, uh, uh, Swiss cheese, and coleslaw are available after service if you would like to purchase some of those. Loved ones, uh, are there any other additions to that fall festival announcement? Great. At this point, I would draw your attention to the messenger in your bulletin. For those of you who are joining us online, you can go to RichvilleUCC.com, go to the Bulletins and Newsletter tab, and there you can download both the worship folder and uh, the Messenger, the weekly calendar insert. Um, a little bit later in service, we'll talk about one of the five national mission offerings of the United Church of Christ. It's the Neighbors in Need Fund. You'll see an insert in your bulletin. Tomorrow night at 6.30 is Consistory. Same thing on Tuesday night for Christian Ed. The rest of the regular weekly schedule continues. Um, this coming Saturday, we uh, hope to have our Saturday meal ministry, but uh, working on volunteers at the moment. Um, you'll notice on the inside of your messenger uh, a variety of notices for the congregation in general, as well as some upcoming dates that you can read for yourself. Before we go any further into worship, I do want to remind folks that as we continue to faithfully assemble in a variety of altered ways in response to the coronavirus, uh, we do still continue to celebrate the Lord's Supper together, both in person and those of you joining us online. Uh, if you have not, please grab your communion packets from the Narthex, and we always have these out for folks the week leading up to a communion Sunday as well. Loved ones, no matter what season we find ourselves in, we serve a mighty and powerful God. So let our opening hymn testify to that. Number 74, I sing the mighty power of God.
who are called to worship, our prayer of confession and assurance of pardon. I am the only one, Jerry. One plus two. Please join me in the call to worship. Whenever we put confidence in our own flesh or accomplishments, grant us humility, O oh God. If we come to believe that our ethnicity or denomination are the source of our salvation, reorient our thinking, O oh Lord. For we know that any earthly gains cannot compare to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus as our Lord. So grant us strength to suffer what we need to in order to gain a relationship with our Savior and to be found in Him. For we know that our righteousness cannot come through our own attempts to fulfill your law, but it comes through faith in Christ. Therefore we ask that you, Holy One, would make us righteous through our faith in you. We want to know Jesus more fully, the power of his resurrection, and the sharing of his suffering so that we too will be resurrected like him. So remind us that we have not yet achieved this goal, but fill us with endurance to keep pressing on. And we will continue to give thanks and praise, for you have made us your own through Christ Jesus. Then, no matter what has happened in the past, we will strain forward toward what lies ahead. The goal and prize of our heavenly calling from you. Amen. which is the reading and the hearing of God's holy word. Continuing this morning with the reading from Exodus, this uh, passage from the Hebrew Bible comes from Exodus 20, verses 1 through 20. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them, or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your town. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the, seventh, the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land your God is giving you. You should not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you should not steal. You should not give false, false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servant, or his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet, and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen. 
do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to you to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. Thank you, Gary. That's God's word to and for the people of God, according to the book of the Exodus of the Hebrew people from the Old Testament. We pray, as always, that the Lord would bless our reading, our hearing, our understanding, and of course, most importantly, our application of this and all of Holy Scripture. But before we do so, uh, we want to take a few moments and share God's love and truth with our youngest friends. As we've uh, added some safety protocols and precautions to worship in person, we have asked that any kids who do make it to worship uh, would remain in their pews with their family units until they're dismissed for Sunday school. So I'm going to ask all the children of God to participate a little bit today. Um, as we look around the sanctuary, the chancel this morning, what is something that we might notice that's a little bit different than usual? It's decorated. Somebody else said the globe. The globe. Okay, so it's decorated uh, uh, quite a bit more than it is at, at many times throughout the church year. The globe sticks out. Um, so why why is the church decorated this way today? World Communion Sunday. Exactly. Exactly. And today um, we're really interested in the fact that God wants to pour out salvation on the whole world. That's part of the reason that we celebrate World Communion Sunday. Because even though there are Christians who practice the faith in different ways and we don't agree about absolutely everything all the time, we all know as Christians that it's through Jesus that the whole world is to be saved. And so we celebrate our unity with Christians of different stripes and flavors today. And part of our unity is not just in Jesus, but also in the Hebrew faith that Jesus himself was a part of, that came before him. Today, Mr. Gary read for us a story out of Exodus about the giving of the Ten Commandments. And I want to say to you today that the Ten Commandments are one of the first signs that God wants all people saved and whole, healthy and whole and holy and well. And I'm going to illustrate that by looking at some of our decorations. Okay. So what aside from the globe, what are some of the decorations that we have on the chancel today? Different communion sets. Different communion sets? Yes. Uh, this one was handcrafted in Israel. Uh, this one was handcrafted in Malawi, Africa. Uh, then the one we'll be using later in service is our traditional liturgical communion set. It's it's from brass. Okay, so we got individual uh, communion sets. What else do we see? Bunch of different crosses, yes. So there's a Jerusalem cross on an Anglican prayer necklace. Uh, there is a Celtic cross hanging over the one communion plate. Uh, there's an abstract cross over there. There's a Roman Catholic rosary over there. Uh, there's the traditional gospel cross of the early church. Uh, there's a, a peace uh, cross in the bread basket. Um, got some other crosses over here. What else do we see? Different breads. Very good. So we've got matzah in honor of our Jewish sisters and brothers. Uh, we've got challah in honor of our Hebrew Christian friends. Uh, we've got naan in honor of our Eastern Indian Christian friends. Uh, there's uh, a French loaf. There's pita for the, the Greek Orthodox uh, Christians. Okay, so uh, what else do we see? Yes, different stoles, right? So we've got a Messianic Jewish prayer shawl, right? A talit. Uh, this actually comes from the chapel of St. Francis um, in, in, in Italy, um, and it's a Roman Catholic stole. This one was handmade for me out of an old hot rod button-up bowling shirt. Um, we had a stole from one of the African tribes and then from another one of the African tribes. Um, we have uh, a drapery uh, from Lindisfarna. Uh, we've got Scottish and Irish representations. So, you just discussed stoles, bread, crosses, and we could keep going. Now, each of those symbols is different, and each of the ones that we pointed out come from different places, but what do they all have in common? They all point us back 
to Christ. Maybe they represent where we grew up or the influences and, and musical and cultural styles and tastes that we have. But all of these things are designed to point us back to Christ. And I want to say that the Ten Commandments, guess what? Every one of the world's <clears throat> cultures and primary religions has a version of the Ten Commandments. And when you line them up, they are insanely similar. So even with the basic rules of how to live life without destroying each other, God has always been trying to get all of us back together, united in the source of our salvation, which is Jesus the Christ, who the Bible also calls the Word made flesh. The law is made perfect in Jesus. So when you look at the Ten Commandments, don't just think about do's and don'ts. Think about how it is that God is trying to heal all the wounds in the world, especially on this World Communion Sunday, when we remember that whether you're a Protestant or you're Roman Catholic or you're non-denominational, born-again, charismatic, whatever flavor of the Jesus movement you are, we are one in his singular saving power. And we are one at the table. We're going to pray for our kiddos. And then we're going to move on with the rest of service heading into our communion meditation. Let's talk to Jesus. Alpha and Omega God, beginning and ending God. God who is over, around, and through the entire creation. We give you thanks for this day. For you have made it. And we will rejoice in it. We bless and praise you that each one of us is wonderfully and fearfully made in your divine image. We thank you, God, that even though we are so wonderfully diverse and different from each other, we all come from the same source, and you're calling us all back to the possibility of a shared eternal destination. May we walk through this world together and God, may your laws, your commands make sense to our kiddos. May they be able to live them out in their daily lives, whether that's at school or around the dining room table with their family or hanging out with their friends and their extracurriculars. Because God, it is your desire that none should perish, but all should be saved. Through the name of your holy son, our precious brother, Savior, and Lord Jesus the Christ. And may all God's kids say, Amen. Amen. Alrighty, and we do give thanks to Miss Jennifer uh, for being prepared to continue the spiritual formation of our little ones. And for the folks who are worshiping with us at home, if you do go to the bulletins and newsletter tab on the website, uh, you can download the weekly children's bulletin to do those activities with your kiddos at home. Friends, uh, as we continue towards the celebration of the Lord's Supper, we do have one additional scripture passage uh, beyond what our call to worship was based on and what Gary read for us. So I'd ask that you would draw your attention to uh, listen to and for the word of God as it comes to us according to Matthew's gospel, chapter 21, verses 23 through 46. Listen to another parable, Jesus said. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruits. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then the landowner sent other servants to them more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, the landowner sent his own son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard returns, what will he do to those tenants? Uh, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied. And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants. He will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. 
Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on him who it falls, they shall be crushed. Now, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that Jesus was a great prophet. This is the good, if challenging, news of Jesus the Christ, according to Matthew's gospel. Thanks be to God. Won't you all join me in another moment of prayer as we prepare for our communion meditation? <clears throat> Maker, owner, redeemer of every good thing. It is in you that we live and move and have our being. It is you who gives us the resources to produce a harvest of righteousness. So we would ask on this day, especially in honor of the gifts of field and vine that we celebrate at the table, especially on a day when we celebrate the table with Christians all around the world, we would pray that the word of scripture would come alive to us. Strengthen and empower us, refine and reform us, that we might indeed produce fruit in keeping with your righteousness. And Holy One, I would ask that the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of each of our hearts and minds might be acceptable in your sight. For this we pray through our rock and redeemer, Jesus the Christ, the resurrected and resurrecting word. And may all God's people say, Amen. Pardon me just a moment. Well, as we know, uh, we are midstream in our fall sermon series, The Ways of the World versus The Way of Jesus, and we will be looking at that in some respects today, uh, but most notably, we're going to look at all of our texts in the context of World Communion Sunday. So as I sometimes need to share with folks, not one of our readings is going to get all of the attention that it needs. Uh, that's for our studies uh, on Wednesday nights, that's for our Sunday school class studies, our individual personal studies to dive a little bit deeper. With that, I will begin in earnest by making um, kind, of, kind of a bit of a, you might say, Pauline, and perhaps even pompous confession to you all. I have obeyed every one of the Ten Commandments, except you shall not lie. Let us remember that if we stand under any of the law of God, none of us is righteous. No, not one. Some part of God's law is going to convict us. Some part of God's law we're going to fall short on. So as I begin the message with that, I think we need to acknowledge that most of us in our culture, particularly in recent years and days, uh, become accustomed to the phrase law and order. Dun dun. <laughs> what I'm going to ask you to do today, put on repeat in the back corner of your brain through the rest of the message time, instead of law and order, dun dun. Instead of that, put in the back corner of your brain the lyrics and the tune to the song popularized by Frank Sinatra and later used in the sitcom Married with Children. The song Love and Marriage, written by James Van Heusen and Sammy Kahn. The original lyrics go like this. Love and marriage, love and marriage. Go together like a horse and carriage. This I tell you, brother, you can't have one without the other. Love and marriage, love and marriage. It's an institute you can't disparage. Ask the local gentry, and they will say it's elementary. Try, try, try to separate them. It's an illusion. Try, 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 and you will only come to this conclusion. Love and marriage. Now replace the words love and marriage with the title of today's sermon. Love and order. Love and order, love and order. Which leads us to kind of the primary question for today's communion meditation as we look at these three scriptural texts. What is the purpose of God's law? 
If we're supposed to be remembering love and order, why did the Lord send the covenant carved into stone tablets and later recorded on scrolls? Why did the Holy One empower prophets to speak out to each successive generation of the people? How is the way of the Jesus the final answer to these questions? Well, it's kind of like what my kids have asked me. Said, Dad, we don't understand. How can God have ten commandments for the whole world, and yet Daddy can have 152 just for this house? <laughs> I'll answer that question sharing a quote from C.S. Lewis. When a man is getting better, he understands more and more clearly the evil that is still left in him. When a man is getting worse, he understands his own badness less and less. Why do rules exist to keep us safe? Why are rules created? Well, they didn't exist because they hadn't been broken. But if there is harm being done to God's good creation, then they come into existence. It seems a preacher had just died, and then he was in the line to go to heaven. There was a guy in front of him waiting to go as well, and the preacher asked the guy, so what did you do professionally in your life? And the gentleman replied, well, I was a, a bus driver, but I always stole and cheated and broke the law a lot. The preacher says, in my life, I was a minister. I always gave to charity, and I was nice to people, and I gave the longest sermons. Eventually, the bus driver, who was slightly ahead, walked up to St. Peter, and they talked for a few minutes. Then the bus driver was let in through the pearly gates. Next, the preacher approached St. Peter. So what did you do in your life, the saint asked. The preacher says, well, I was a preacher. I always did good things, and I tried following the commandments. Do I get to go to heaven? Peter says, I don't know. What? asked the preacher. How come the bus driver who admitted his sins got to go to heaven? Well, explained St. Peter, when you gave your sermons, everyone was falling asleep. But when he drove his bus, everyone was always praying. <laughs> How does our understanding and application of God's laws produce or not produce righteousness in the world? Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 and 13, tell us explicitly God's intention for giving us any of the precepts that we find in sacred scripture. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you? But to stand in awe of the Lord, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. What is the ultimate impact, the effect of how we understand and apply any godly principle? As the ancient rabbi said, law was not, man was not made for the law. The law was made for man. They also said build a fence around the law, not a wall. A fence is a, protects what's on the inside, but is also approachable by others from the outside. We were not designed to fulfill the law's purpose. The law was given to us that we might fulfill God's purposes for us. The law cannot become an end unto itself. It always serves a redemptive purpose. We see this in today's parable out of Matthew 21, and it is a jarring set of images, the landowner getting so upset at each successive attack upon his representatives from the people to whom he's renting. And parables are difficult things to interpret and apply in a neat and tidy way, but let us, for the sake of argument, assume that the landowner is a stand-in for God, the Creator. And the first set of representatives are the law and then the prophets. And the final representative is the landowner's own son, who is G. 
Jesus the Christ. And what was it that the landowner was asking? That the people not enjoy the winepress and the vineyard? No, that they should bear fruit and give it back to the one who gave them all their gifts in the first place. What is the purpose of the law? It is to maintain both love and order. In each of the Ten Commandments, we can see that it is designed to be a social contract that keeps the community from killing itself or one another. Love and order. Seems there was a rabbi who was going to a restaurant who had been going to for many years. And this rabbi was, was an orthodox, kosher Jew. And this particular restaurant managed to keep kosher items and cooking requirements on their menu in their kitchen. But they also had the most amazing bacon and pork products. And everybody who knew the rabbi was always telling me, isn't it a shame that you can't eat anything from a pig? I mean, this sandwich is delicious. I can't believe how wonderful this roast is. So one day the rabbi said to himself, you know what? I'm getting on in years. I've always done my best to be good. So if I do this one thing, I'm sure it won't really matter. And he went back to the restaurant and decided he was going to get some pork. And since it would be the first and last time that he ever tried it, he thought to himself, you know what, might as well be hanged for a sheep as for a lamb. And he ordered the fanciest pig dish on the menu. A few minutes later, the waiter came in with a tray carrying a whole roasted suckling pig with a big red apple tucked into its mouth. He placed it on the table. And the rabbi picked up his fork and was about to tuck into the meal when he heard a voice behind him. Rabbi, is that you? And he turned around, and he saw one of the people from his synagogue. And they both looked at each other, and then at the pig, and then back at one another. And the man said, Rabbi, what's going on? And the rabbi said, I know, disgusting, isn't it? I ordered an apple, and look how they served it. <laughs> we can cover over both our sins by manipulating the word of God. And we can also turn the word of God into a cudgel that inhibits the enjoyment of life for ourselves and for others. What does the way of Jesus ask us to do? I think if we return to today's Philippians reading that our call to worship was based upon, we recognize that even a Jew among Jews, a Pharisee among Pharisees, a man who kept the law in the strictest ways possible, Paul acknowledged that the gospel of our Savior is ultimately not about personal piety, but it's about a pursuit of health, wholeness, wellness, and unity, even amongst those with whom we have disputes and disagreements. A little boy named Johnny, one of the first churches I served, came up and in Sunday school, and uh, he said, if you go to church every week and try to live your life following the Ten Commandments, will you get into heaven? No, Johnny, I said. He said, well, what if I sold my house, my car, and all of my possessions, and then I gave all of my money to the church? Would I get into heaven? No, Johnny. So he decided to turn the tables, and he said, okay, if I, and I, he said, you asked me a question. I said, okay, well, if I spend my whole life being charitable, loving my family, and being kind to everyone I meet, would I get into heaven then? No, said Johnny. And I was, I was surprised that he was getting, getting the message. And I said, so how do you get into heaven? He said, you have to be dead. <laughs> Which, there are two truths about the kingdom of God. 
One is that there is an eternal destination that we long for and we can only enter into through the grace and the redeeming work of Jesus the Christ. The other is that while we're on this side of the wall around the proverbial wine press and vineyard, we are expected to bear fruit and create as much of the kingdom in our own lives and world as possible. Why do we have the law? What difference does it make in our lives and world? The law has always been about creating a more just and equitable society, one that more closely resembles the kingdom to come every day in every way, while still showing us how far we have yet to go. The author Gary Anderson, in the lectionary commentary on the Old Testament and Acts, talks about these readings and warns us against the danger of domesticating the living words of God. Indeed, the deep significance of the gift of the Ten Commandments has been obscured, if not lost, in our domestication of them, in making them into a cultural icon. As a consequence, we lose the sense of awe that we read about in the Deuteronomy passage. We lose a sense of wonder that comes from the Exodus story. We lessen our understanding and receiving of the commandments of God as revelation to us and for us. These are not ten good maxims for the good life, Anderson wrote, but the living words of a living God. The ways of the world ask us to worship the Ten Commandments engraved in stone as an idol, which, by the way, if you didn't pick up on it, one of the first commandments says we're not supposed to worship graven images. Or asks us to use the law as a cudgel to judge and beat others down with, rather than the way of Jesus, which is a living word that holds the whole community together, healing and restoring us, pointing out where we are wounded and empowering us to offer succor to the wounds of others. So let us bear in mind that from the beginning, God's law and truth is designed for love and order. And we experience that in a precious and powerful way on this Sunday every year when we approach the banquet feast of the Lamb on World Communion Sunday. As we come to this table, this holy meal, shared in a variety of ways across time, around the globe, through different cultures, we know that there is one body, there is one cup, and we are one people with one purpose, that is to love and serve the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, that all people might enjoy this meal of salvation that was offered to us for free, but asks us to participate in. Amen. Dearest friends, as we ready our hearts, our minds, and indeed even our bodies to receive the Eucharist, we do so through the gift of music with the first and second verses of the hymn, Here at Thy Table, Lord.
dearest friends, those who are members of this particular congregation within the denomination of the United Church of Christ, those who are friends and regular worshipers, but perhaps not members of this local faith community, those of you who worship the Lord Jesus of Nazareth in different traditions, whether we come together watching this service in person or online right now or at another time throughout the day, let us remember that we, when we come to this shared meal, we do so in remembrance of Jesus the Christ and the fact that on the last night of the earthly festivities that he would ever share with his nearest and dearest friends, his closest disciples, who themselves were made up of a broad cross-section of Jewish and Roman society in the day. We remember that at the end of the Jewish Passover meal, that meal which celebrated God's act of liberation for the slaves from Egypt, at the end of that meal, Jesus brought forth fresh bread, and he poured a new cup. And he took the bread, and he blessed it, and gave thanks for it, and broke it, and said, this is my body, broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup, the cup of the new covenant, the cup of the prophet Elijah, who was and was to come again, and he said, this cup has been poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of the sins of the many. Anytime you eat this bread or drink this cup, do so in remembrance of me. But behold, we shall not share this meal together again until we do so anew in the Father's kingdom. But Jesus also said elsewhere that whenever two or more gather in his name, he is present in their midst. So if we are eating bread and we are drinking the fruit of the vine together in his name, he is with us and we are, if only for a moment, in the kingdom of heaven. Let us pray. Life giver, life sustainer, life redeemer and renewer. We come before you this morning and we bless and praise you for the gift of this special liturgical celebration, for the gift of your law and prophets contained within the sacred scriptures, for the gift of the word of life made flesh in Jesus himself, for the gift of your people around the globe and throughout the ages, for the gift of bread and cup and holy fellowship. And as we give you thanks and praise, we would ask that your spirit would fall upon whatever elements we are using to join together at Christ's table. Strengthen the bread and water in someone's living room. Build up the pre-sealed packets that we use in our own worship service. Pour out life and forgiveness in the cup I will drink. Make the elements and we, your people, united in the power of resurrection for all of creation, knowing that it was through your Son and his death and life anew that we too can have life abundant and eternal. Amen. Beloved, the invitation goes out to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west, to Jew, to Greek, to free, to slave, to male, to female, to any and all who would humbly confess and repent of their sin and embrace the gift of salvation represented in this meal. But as we ready ourselves to enjoy the abundance of God, let us recall what Paul said. We ought eat and drink this meal in a worthy manner, which means that we have to acknowledge how we've fallen short of God's law, and we also have to extend grace to those who have done likewise. So let us thankfully and humbly come before the banquet feast of the Lamb, for behold, all things have been made ready. The food of God for the people of God, paid for at great price, but offered free from cost. This is the body of Christ, broken to put us back together. Take and eat.
the cup of the new covenant, the cup of salvation, the cup of the kingdom that is and is to come. Let us drink. Let us pray once more. <clears throat> Holy One of all the ages and places in this great, grand cosmos, you who established creation out of love in an ordered way, we bless and praise you that when we rally around the communion table, when we link up in fellowship and mutual pursuits of the wisdom of the scriptures, when we join together on the path of discipleship that is following the way of Jesus, we can and are reordered to fulfill your purpose for our individual lives and our life together. We shout hallelujah that our purpose is to enjoy and to pass on that word of redemption and salvation, which can be found only in the way of Jesus the Christ. So it is to him that we now renew our commitment, praying together the prayer that he taught his own disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. As we know, one of the, the great joys, one of the profound privileges, one of the amazing powers that comes to us in the Christian life is that we get to share our lives with one another, that we do get to maintain community and to bring God's healing to the world. And one of the ways that we do that is through lifting up our shared joys and concerns. So at this time, I would draw your attention to the back of the weekly messenger. There you'll see your update and ongoing prayer list. If you're joining us online, you can, of course, type in any public prayer concerns in the comments field of this video. If you have private uh, prayers and concerns, you can contact me through uh, phone, by text, uh, or voicemail. You can email me. You can instant message me. Uh, you can also share uh, prayer concerns by contacting the office or one of the call to care members. And if you're here in person, you can always fill out a prayer card and drop it in either the offering page plate at the back or in the welcome center in the prayer box. Uh, beyond the items that you see printed in black and white there, um, I do need to share that Elizabeth uh, Whitaker's father, Chuck Regula, who we've been praying for pretty intensely for the past couple of weeks, uh, all of the procedures that he has undergone um, have had temporary effect, but his uh, body is, is, is not uh, weathering it all too particularly well. And uh, at this time, he is, he is moving into the hospice phase. Um, fortunately, uh, Elizabeth and her siblings and her mom have been able to get into the Cleveland Clinic to see him. Unfortunately, the reason that everybody's able to right now is because uh, of the hospice diagnosis. Please continue to pour out your love, your strength, and support your prayer, compassion, empathy, and sympathy um, for Elizabeth, her mom, her siblings, her kids, her husband, uh, in these difficult days to face anything, let alone this kind of diagnosis. As we discuss diagnoses, uh, I want to lift up as both a matter of joy and of concern, um, which is somewhat unfortunately apt for World Communion Sunday, but uh, as, as folks have been for the last few days, we want to add our prayers with people who do and do not like uh, the political agenda of our president, who all have been praying for his welfare since his COVID diagnosis. 
Um, and I think that's uh, the beauty of our shared humanity and certainly our shared Christianity is that we are praying for that uh, man, for, for President Trump. Uh, we pray for the good function of his office. We pray for his staff who have also contracted it. We give thanks for and ask strength for all of those who are providing medical care both uh, out of the White House uh, medical office and then, of course, um, at Walter Reed right now. Um, this is uh, part of, of the, the beauty amidst the pain um, of, of our shared global struggle right now is that uh, we can ask God's healing for one another uh, in, in these dire days. Um, returning to Joyce, as we noted at the beginning of service, we do once again give God thanks for everybody who made a changed fall festival still a mighty success. And uh, we had folks who, who donated the actual material items to make the dinners. We had folks who put together lavish raffle baskets we had people who set up and tear, tore down. We had folks who um, uh, worked in the kitchen. We had people who were directing traffic, older and younger. We had uh, people bringing in their baked goods, folks who purchased the meals and contributed extra funds. Uh, and do bear in mind that the income that comes from the Fall Festival empowers our ministry for mission and ministry uh, through our outreach committee. That's where the outreach committee budget comes from each year. So uh, not uh, only are we serving the interest of Ritual UCC, but our ministry to the rest of the community outside of our own formal congregation. So thank you all who participated in any of those ways. It was uh, a profound success considering the challenges and the adjustments that we had to make this year. Uh, are there other pressing joys and concerns among those assembled today? Debbie. I do have a list of the basket winners that I will post um, out in the hallway and they'll also be in the newsletter. <laughs> Strangely enough, as you were talking about everyone who came to not only our church members but outside of our church, we had 10 winners that were church members, seven winners that were community members. So it was a nice mix. Amen. That's awesome. Uh, for those of you who didn't hear that, um, we will be posting uh, in other places who the basket winners were, but as Debbie noted, kind of a joy, uh, out of the, the 17 baskets, 10 were Richmond UCC members, but seven were just friends in the community supporting our ministry. So praise God for that, that's, that's really beautiful. Anything else, friends? All right, well, as we noted at the communion table, anytime we gather in the name of Jesus, he's present in their midst. Uh, so we know that the Lord has been listening along with everything we've been talking about. Uh, nevertheless, we're going to formalize our prayer. God of grace and God of glory, you who holds the foundations of the earth together, you who places your own essence within each of us that we would long after more of you. We come to you once more this morning, and we are a thankful people that despite our assorted challenges, our losses, our grief, our anxiety and uncertainty, still your provision goes before us and we see signs of life and restoration as you knit this fractured world back together. So we would ask, O oh God, that those who are heartbroken in this time, those who are not receiving what they need to live joyfully and abundantly, that they would sense your powerful presence in their midst, and that some way, somehow, you would open the storehouses of heaven to give them the resources they need to be instruments of your peace and healing in their own lives. God, we do thank you for the medical practitioners who are your earthly hands and feet, those who do the work of the great physician through modern medical miracles. And God, we would ask in the days ahead, each of us and all of us would lean into your unifying personhood and purpose, that we would have wisdom and strength, endurance to push forward toward the goal of our faith, which is our salvation and the promise of resurrection through Jesus the Christ. 
It is in his name and through the promise of the Holy Spirit that we turn to you now with those prayers that we can't give shape to with human words. Receive then our personal, our private, our silent petitions. God, you are, in our tradition, referred to as the still-speaking God. You spoke the world into existence. You gave our ancient Jewish forebearers your law written by human hands. You had that law interpreted through the prophets who called the people back to right relationship with you and one another. You sent your son Jesus, the perfect embodiment of your words of life. Then you gave us the apostles and the gospel authors to further help us interpret and put your precepts into practice. For all of that, we thank and bless you and ask that all of our shared prayer would somehow be magnified and made more effective to your glory and the healings of the nations. This we pray through the power and authority granted us in Jesus the Christ. Amen. Stewardship 
and sign up for electronic deductions. All of these ways, along with your sweat hours and your in-kind donations, uh, do allow us to be Christ's body here on this earth for those who still need to meet and receive him. So with that, let us give thanks, taking up our tithes and our offerings. Thank you. 